We're going to take a lesson today from uh, Matthew chapter 15, and in the Bible it's 985, and it's from verses 10 to 28. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into the pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. Eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possessions. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. <laughs> yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have a great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Okay, can, um, <clears throat> can I just ask you to all um, stretch out a hand this morning? Andrew's coming to us to speak this morning for the first time, so, you know, a little bit nervous, so just, just encourage him. <clears throat> Father, we just want to say thank you for the man that Andrew is. Father, that his heart is for you. And Father, as he brings your word this morning, help us to take seriously what is being said. And uh, if it's to challenge us or to encourage us, help us just to take it as you would want us to receive it. I just pray for your anointing upon Andrew and just uh, use the words that he has on the paper just to edify us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so today I'd like to share some thoughts based on the two events we heard read. The two stories contrast outward appearance with inner reality. They contrast the pride in self-achievement with the humility that sees the need for a saviour. They contrast futile religious practices with simple trusting faith. And the accounts are of great importance to us because they teach us how to relate to God and to each other. We're drawn to the love and need for our Savior. We learn today that religious practices and observances of laws look impressive, but actually only deal with outer appearances. They can't change people's hearts. Their origins are man-made traditions, and the most dangerous aspect is that people think in keeping certain traditions or laws, they can actually gain acceptance in God's sight, thereby doing away with the need for a saviour. On the other hand, a definition of faith I came across in a dictionary was complete trust or confidence in someone or something. The Bible itself defines faith as confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see in Hebrews 11. And in our study of Romans, we've been learning how Abraham's faith in God was credited to him as righteousness. 
Faith has an object, and we'll see that if the object of faith is trust in Jesus Christ, nothing is impossible. So our first story is set in the context of Jesus challenging the hypocrisy he'd found in the religious leaders of his day. Jesus had been speaking of those who honor God with their lips, but whose hearts were far from him. He draws attention to ceremonial traditions that built up around eating certain foods and the washing of hands before eating. An observance of all this sort of ritual purity was a sign of righteousness to the religious leaders. Jesus' emphasis is not on what goes in and out of the body, but what comes from the heart. So he says, as we heard read, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them or make them unclean in the version we heard, But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. So it's not a matter of what is seen on the outside that's important, but what's going on unseen on the inside. The Pharisees were pretty offended when Jesus challenged their ritual observance. They felt that their security and right standing in God's eyes was based on these observances. Jesus explained to his disciples that the Pharisees, rather than being leaders, were actually blind guides, leading people astray, and he said to leave them alone. They'd missed the whole point. They would be uprooted. But the disciples had not understood either. It wasn't what was going into a person, the visible food that defiled. It was what was going on inside, not visibly in the stomach, but invisibly in the heart which God looked at rather than outward appearances. Now, this wasn't a new idea. After all, Samuel had chosen David as king because the Lord had explained that he does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's 1 Samuel 16, 7. So the heart, it's understood as the center of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Jesus had warned the disciples about the seriousness of the defilement that can come from the heart. Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. When we remember that he taught earlier in Matthew's Gospel that being angry with someone was as bad as murder and looking lustfully was the same as adultery, we can see that these defilements affect us all. Against such wickedness, the futility of washing one's hands or avoiding certain foods in an attempt to be clean becomes apparent. And in Mark's account of this story, all foods were declared clean anyway. So the Pharisees missed the point, and in their pride, they were actually dishonoring God with their religious observances. Yet true faith was to be found in a place where Matthew's readers would not have expected. It was found in a Canaanite woman from the Gentile region of Tyre and Sidon. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me, my daughter's demon-possessed and suffering terribly. There's no pretense. There's just sheer, desperate, audacious faith crying out to Jesus as Lord, honoring him as the son of David when the Pharisees had despised him and they'd failed to recognize who he was and his authority. And yet Jesus is silent. The disciples want rid of her. Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. She's a problem. She's an embarrassment to them. But her faith persists. She's not shaken. She doesn't leave. Jesus doesn't send her away. Now, instead of silence, an answer from Jesus. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. She doesn't give up. Unlike the Pharisees, she does not take offense, but persists with humble faith, even in the face of discouragement. Lord, help me. Now, we might have expected a healing at this point for Matthew to tell us Jesus had been moved with compassion. But no, again, her faith is tested. Jesus replies, 
it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, the word Jesus used for dogs is thankfully not as insulting as it may at first sound, as it was the form used for domestic pets rather than the usual form which was used at that time for an insult. But the situation is still tense. What will she do? What will Jesus do? She's kneeling in humility and no doubt looked down upon by some present there as a woman and as a Gentile. Her faith that Jesus is the only one who can heal her daughter is unshaken even in the face of this testing of her faith. Instead of doubting Jesus' willingness to heal her daughter, she doesn't leave but answers humbly yet confidently from her heart, Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I mean, what faith? What an answer. And for that answer and for that faith, her request is granted and her daughter is healed in that very hour. Jesus heals her daughter based on her faith in him. Her persistent, humble, audacious faith pays off. She didn't give up. She didn't run away. She didn't protest. She didn't beg. With dignity, she showed her worth in front of those who would have sent her away packing. The one considered unworthy by society and unclean shows greater faith than those who should have been leading. Jesus shows his willingness to reach out to those who approach him in true faith. He may have tested her faith, but it was in the end to her vindication in front of the crowd. What a contrast. The pride of the religious leaders contrasted to the faith of the simple, trusting woman. Religious practice has achieved nothing in terms of getting those who practiced it nearer God. Yet a simple, unsophisticated, looked down upon woman moved the very heart of Jesus because of her faith. And as a result, her daughter was healed. So we've looked at the biblical accounts, but why is it important for us today to recognize religious practices and attitudes? First, because religion blinds people to the truth that they need to repent in humility and put their trust in Christ. It's rooted in pride. It convinces people that their own practices or religious observance earn salvation, thus doing away with the need for a saviour. Jesus' death on the cross becomes seen as an example of self-sacrifice rather than the atoning, saving sacrifice for sins that it is. The truth that Christ sets us free from trying to fulfill the law, is lost. Second, it's important today for us to recognize because it kills the joy of true faith by trapping people into feeling guilt-ridden and condemned because we can't keep laws. And it leads to the mental torment of many precious Christian souls. The enemy steals the joy that they were meant to have. People wonder if they will go to hell. They feel condemned day and night by the accuser of the brethren, not knowing that they can resist him with the confidence that there is no condemnation for those in Christ. The image of God gets twisted from a compassionate father full of love and mercy to a harsh taskmaster who cannot be pleased. Third, it's important to recognize today because religion is divisive. People who are operating under a religious spirit often think that they, and only they, are right. And it leads to the division of churches and society. People can be driven to do evil as they look down on others because they think that they are earning salvation through acts that are actually causing others great hurt and turning 
others away from God. So what do we need to do if we recognize these attitudes at work? Well, first we need to repent of thinking that anything other than Jesus' sacrifice on the cross on our behalf can save us from God's wrath. Let us turn to him and put all our trust in him, not partially, but fully. Good works, church activities, and charitable acts do not make us righteous with God. In contrast to our holy God, Isaiah tells us that all our righteous acts are like filthy rags before him. That's Isaiah 64, verse 4. We must fully turn to Christ, turn away from sin and cling to his cross. We can't run from God. We must run to him and we will find his arms of love and mercy open wide for us. We may need to repent of the idolatry of listening to the religious spirit because by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. It's faith that pleases God. And the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Secondly, if we are in Christ, there is no condemnation. We need to use scripture to refute the condemnation that comes from the accuser of the brethren, who is Satan. Satan actually means the accuser. The defense is the blood of Jesus. We need to actively put on the armor of God as we refute the enemy on the basis of God's word. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So God sees us in Christ. Even when we sin, if we have sincerely trusted in Christ, we're still God's children. We repent and we ask for his help to overcome, but we do it because we love him and know the price he's paid for us. No one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. God's perfect love drives out all fear, all fear of judgment, all fear of condemnation. 1 John 4 is a key scripture. It tells us God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Third, as Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Are our hearts honoring God and not just our lips? We come to Jesus trusting and loving him from our hearts, not out of religious duty. Are our hearts honoring others? Do we count them as better than ourselves? Jesus actually gives the command to love one another. And by that love, all people will know that we're his disciples. It's that love that draws others in. As they see our love for each other, they will see the love of God. This isn't to condemn us. This is to spur us on to pray to God for the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We need to turn our hearts over to Jesus and ask him to give us his heart of love for each other. It's so hard at times, but we need to forgive. We need to bless. We need to overcome our desire to nurse hurts. We don't want a root of bitterness to grow up. We don't want our hearts to be defiled by the evil thoughts Jesus warned us about. And we can make the decision to actively forgive anyone who's wronged us and we will be set free. 
So today we come to him in full assurance of faith. Even in the face of discouragement, opposition, rejection or offense, like that woman, we need to persist in faith, trusting that he can and will act and that he has a good and perfect plan for us. That all things work together for good for those who love God. When the storms of life hit, our faith is not in our own actions. It's in the one who has authority over the storms. The one who does not send us away, but looks for us to open our hearts and our mouths to declare his praises, even before we see the answer, even as we go through the storm. So let's not cower when the storm hits us, but let us rise up in faith and declare like Habakkuk, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. We need to ask ourselves sincerely. Are we doing religion? Or do we have unshakable faith in Christ? Like the Canaanite woman. It's easy to do activities in church here on Sunday, but what happens when condemning thoughts, guilt, anxiety, fear, depression, doubt, rejection, or sins that we can't seem to overcome strike us on Monday? Today we can come for prayer with expectant faith. We can ask God to increase our faith if we're lacking. As we worship him and study his word, our faith in him and who he is will increase. The Lord is present. He's willing to help and heal us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And no one can snatch us out of his hand. Let's pray. Lord, it's for freedom you've set us free. We let go of religion and the pride of religion of trying to earn our own salvation. In humility, we turn to you in faith. Forgive us our sins, Lord. We repent and trust in you and you alone for salvation. We thank you that by grace we've been saved through faith. And this is not our own doing. It's your gift, Lord God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. Lord, we pray that you'd set us free from every bondage, from sins that have captured us and torn our hearts away from you. We pray that you would heal us, Lord, and heal our loved ones. We long to see you, Lord, move in power as we reach out to you in faith, as we fall on our knees before you, Lord. We love you and adore you. We worship you, Son of God, Son of David, be glorified. Amen.